Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or night, whatever you are watching us from today. Uh, this is Veronica Montoya. I am part of the fourth lead team, and I'm pleased to welcome you today into our demo day. Here is where our special cohort members uh, from our Global start a Startup Accelerator will be telling us about, uh, about their venture, uh, uh, their uh, 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 awesome ventures. So it has been an intense six week journey for them. So from fourthly, we're very proud and happy to see them succeed today. So uh, we're very happy also to have you all of you here. And I will also introduce you to Brett Waters, our CEO, who will be running through today uh, during this special event. Thank you, Brett, and thank you all. Awesome, thank you, Veronica, and welcome to, uh, to everybody. So I'm actually joining you today from Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, I'm at the Web Summit uh, conference, which as you may know, it's the largest tech conference in the world. It's an extraordinary collection of CEOs and world leaders uh, together to talk about um, kind of the future of technology and, and society. Um, it's been a very inspirational uh, week. We've had, um, you know, we've heard from the CTO of Amazon and the prime minister of Denmark. Uh, we've heard, heard from the COO of Reddit uh, and the CEO of the Obama Foundation. Uh, an extraordinary collection of leaders, both company leaders and government leaders from around the world have been gathered here this week in Lisbon, Portugal at the Web Summit. Um, and we've been talking about the amazing amount of innovation and entrepreneurship that's happening all over the world today. So I'm here on this live stream to introduce you to seven amazing startups from around the world. Uh, who have uh, been immersed together for the last six weeks in the Fourth Lee Startup Accelerator. And they were selected to participate in this cohort of the Fourth Lee Startup Accelerator because um, in a very real way, these seven startups represent seven really important trends going on in the world today. Uh, and so I think you'll hear, you'll enjoy hearing from each of them and hearing about the um, startup that each of them is leading in the way in which their startup is addressing a problem worth solving in the world today. Um, and, and first up is, uh, is Shamil Khan. And um, uh, so as we all know, electric cars, EVs, electric vehicles have crossed the tipping point from being a niche market thing to it's very clear now that they are about to become a mass market thing, right? That nearly every major car manufacturer has announced uh, a new line of EVs, uh, but we're going to need charging infrastructure. There's not nearly enough charging structure right now in place for the amount of electric vehicles that we'll have on the road before long. And so um, that's the first important trend that uh, we're going to talk about today. And here to talk about is Shamil Khan, the CEO of Charge Station. And uh, Shamil, let me just get your, get your slides up here on the screen, and then uh, I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Brett. So as Brett said, my name is Shamayel Khan. I'm the CEO of Charge Station. A little bit more about me. I'm on the founding team of three other companies. These companies have combined revenues in the seven-figure range over the past two years. At Charge Station, we're building fast chargers for electric vehicles that can charge up to 200 miles in 15 minutes. We see two key problems in EV charging. The first is the lack of fast chargers, which has actually created a term known as range anxiety. And the second is the fact that charging is complicated. When you compare the number of fast charging stations to the number of gas stations, you can see that there's a significant gap. It's also worth mentioning the fact that charging stations don't have any of the same logistical challenges as gas stations. These are some of the world's largest automotive companies that have made commitments towards electrification. And these commitments have led to huge projected growth in the number of EVs on the road upwards of 30 million by 2030. So to recap, there's a massive gap in the market. There's vast projected growth, and this growth is guaranteed growth. On to the fact that charging is complicated. So kilowatt hour units make calculations unpredictable, and you need algorithms to make them accurately. And from a competition standpoint, some, char some chargers require proprietary apps to make payments, and this makes them unfriendly for public adoption. So we have proprietary software that give charging time and pricing estimates so that consumers can make informed decisions. 
We also offer custom integrations for businesses so that they can seamlessly integrate charge stations into their business. In terms of our business model, we have a B2B component where we lease charge stations to other businesses, and this lets them attract more business and add a revenue channel. We have a direct-to-consumer portion where we host the charge stations ourselves, and we have government contracts and grants. The market rate for fast charging is 40 to 50 cents per kilowatt hour, and the average cost is about 11 cents. So charge stations can make four to $600 per day. Gas stations are notorious on running on razor thin margins, and they can make as little as $100 per day. In terms of our competition, we're uniquely positioned as not only an owner operator, but also as a manufacturer that intends to sell to third parties. And that brings us to our competitive advantages. So our leasing model helps us expand much quicker than our competitors. Doing the manufacturing on our own lets us be owner operators for far less. Our emphasis on fast charging and only fast charging helps boost our brand image. And our proprietary software not only simplifies the charging experience for EV owners, but also simplifies the rollout for businesses. So thank you for listening to our presentation. If you'd like to help us power the future of mobility, my email is sham at chargestation.io. It's up on the slide. Feel free to reach out. Very nicely done, Jamal. That was terrific. Um, and, you know, I meant to mention to the audience that uh, uh, if you have any questions for any of our presenters today, please type them there into the comments box in front of you and type those comments in and uh, we'll get to the, as many of them as we can. So, uh, Shmuel, one question that comes in um, uh, from a guy named Dan has to do with, so you mentioned gas stations. Yes. Um, but are there other, are there other kinds of uh, properties that these could be installed at? Yeah, sure. So we've spoken with commercial property managers and they they see application in, say, shopping centers where you go and if they have a grocery store, for example, that they're leasing out to a tenant and they install charging stations there while the person's parking and filling up, they can add a revenue channel through there. It's a sort of passive income stream, but convenience stores, grocery stores, really anywhere where there's real estate. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And another question that's coming in has to do with, um, I mean, isn't Tesla already kind of the leader in this space? Are you, are you going to compete with Tesla on, on these chargers? Sure. So the supercharger network is proprietary, at least in America. And I mean, the network is fairly small right now. The projected growth is massive. So, I mean, we can sort of sit around and wait or we can take part in the market. Well, I guess the other thing is that, uh, you know, Tesla's main business is selling cars. Um, so that really, you know, that's the reason they have the charging stations has to do with driving cars. Selling sales. cars, right. Right, yeah. right, right. Whereas you're, you're able to focus on, you know, simply helping customers of all, with all different brands. Right. right. And business owners can add a revenue channel because they get proceeds of the charging revenue. So. Right, right, right. Um, right. Terrific. All right, Jamal, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up is uh, Jeff. I should, I should also mention that Shamal is joining us from, uh, from Virginia, so joining us from the east coast of the United States. Um, and now uh, next up is Alex. Alex is joining us from, from Italy. Hello, everyone. After, afternoon, Alex. <laughs> Good afternoon. So, uh, so another major kind of trend in the world today is remote work, um, that remote work was already... Uh, kind of a growing tend, trend for knowledge workers. Um, and then all of a sudden the pandemic hit, right? And suddenly everybody was a remote worker. <laughs> and now it seems pretty clear that even as the pandemic um, ends, hopefully, um, it seems pretty clear that the remote work thing will continue. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, knowledge workers today have the luxury of the fact that what they do for a living, many of them, can be done from anywhere. Um, and so they want to take advantage of that. And a couple of the sessions that I've been attending here at Web Summit this week have had to do with, um, you know, interviews with CEOs about what their plans are post pandemic with regard to uh, work rules. And pretty much the unanimous opinion of all the CEOs that I've seen interviewed here at Web Summit is that uh, the hybrid model is the future of work. That, um, you know, what CEOs want, of course, is top tier talent, right? That's what a CEO wants is top tier talent. And the top tier talent today wants, wants the flexibility of having a hybrid work structure. 
So I think it's pretty clear that's a salient trend in the marketplace uh, today. Um, and Alex is going to tell us about uh, his startup in this area. So Alex, right. take it away. Take, take it. Thank you, Brett. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm the co-founder of Unplan. Unplan is an upcoming application that brings remote workers together in person. What's happening nowadays is that um, I've been traveling. So first of all, I've been traveling around the world for the last three years. I've been building communities and have met so many remote workers. However, there is one main pain point that remote workers are still dealing with, which is loneliness. They rely on platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, or Meetup. However, these platforms are not really made for them. Remote workers, when they move to a new city, they always have to spend so much time joining events, joining communities, joining groups, which takes them so much time before they can actually feel satisfied socially. So many times they just end up doing activities on their own, and many times they feel lonely. So we created Unplan, which is an application that has an algorithm that matches remote workers based on similar preferences, uh, hobbies, and other passions. And guess what? The good thing about Unplan is that you don't even have to think about a place. Just be in the city and automatically Unplan will find you a place for you as well. Our initial target market is going to be digital nomads, freelancers, and remote workers. However, we're planning on expanding and target also the online student market. It's estimated that by 2025, only in US, more than 40 million Americans will work remotely. So imagine how many more there's going to be in Europe and Asia that not only they're going to work remotely, but they're going to feel lonely. How are we going to get paid? This is going to be a $19 a month subscription, which gives you access to unlimited invites in selected remote friendly cities. Also, we're working on a referral model with our users and our community partners. Speaking of our community partners, we're currently working with the most excited people who are interested in bringing remote workers together in person. So they are our, our initial community partners that we are working with. We're also iterating our product with them. And by um, 2022, we're planning on launching a full application in eight selected remote friendly cities. By 2024, we're planning on targeting also the online student market. Behind the product, that is me and Domenico. We're both technical. However, I work more on the business and product side, while Domenico works more on the deep technical side. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you guys have any questions, if you would like to reach out, feel free to do so. Thank you. Very nice, uh, Alex. So um, I read somewhere, so The Economist magazine has an article uh, uh, just, I think it was last week, talking about how Europeans in particular are taking advantage of the remote work thing. Uh, and partly, of course, it's because within the Schengen zone in Europe, um, you can travel kind of more or less without borders. Uh, and uh, and they, this article from The Economist claims that in 2022, uh, up to a third of the workers in France and Germany uh, expect to work remotely. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, those are the, those are the two largest economies in the EU. And if a, th yes. if a third, if a third of the workers in the two largest economies in the EU are going to be working remotely, that's, that's a pretty significant trend. So explain yeah. to us how, how you're going to, um, so right now you're kind of serving, um, two or three specific cities that are very popular for remote workers, but explain to us how you're going to kind of scale that up and add additional cities. Yeah, so at, at the beginning, as I said, I'm, the, the best way to work to target remote workers is to focus on community organizers who are already bringing communities together. We are bringing people together. So we're working on building a platform that makes sense for communities, but also for remote workers. We also want to make sure that community organizers get paid for this because most of the events that they are doing on Facebook or Meetup, they're not, they're not paid. They're not getting paid. So it's important to change the model because the community is becoming more important than ever, especially with remote work. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 that was great. It's great. And then Keith, Keith asks about the current funding stage. What's the current okay. funding stage? Uh, at the moment, we are just self-sustainable. We're, we're working on this product. Um, we've been working on the product for the last two years, doing research and also dealing with the trends of COVID. So I would say that uh, uh, yeah, we're looking for seed funding in order to be able to deploy our application into iOS and Android. Like I said before, we're both technical. However, it would be nice to have someone on the on the application side who will be able to support us. Our largest risk, I think, will be COVID because if if there is COVID nineteen again, 
there may be a risk that everything will move back to virtual. So that's the right. biggest risk. Right. And at the moment, what you're offering is remote workers a chance to meet up in person. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, However, if, so if COVID, if COVID, go, if COVID goes, goes sideways again, then that may, may be a risk. Uh, and right. the risk, uh, we've been dealing with COVID, uh, uh, we're dealing with the risk, with the trends of COVID. So we're making sure that our application also will cater to a virtual situation in case that things go south again with COVID-19. Right, right. Terrific. Alex, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, another sort of obvious trend going on in the world today is medical technology, right? That there's just extraordinary innovation going on in the field of, of, of medicine and the field of biotechnology and in, uh, in medical technologies and in general medical devices and, and such. Um, and there's also... Um, Kind of along with that, there's kind of this increasing awareness today of the fact that when you think about health, you have to think holistically, right? That each part of your mind and body interacts with all the other parts of your mind and body. Um, and so our next presenter, um, Dr. Jeff, um, aligns with both of these two uh, trends, that he's going to talk a little bit about, bi about medical technology he's developed, that he's going to talk about how uh, one part of the body ends up uh, having a pretty deep impact on other parts of the body. So, uh, morning, Jeff, where are you, where are you this morning? Uh, I'm actually, uh, in Miami at the American Academy of Periodontology conference. Excellent. I, you know, I was going to go to that conference, but I forgot about it this year. So I came to web summit in Lisbon instead. <laughs> okay. I have to go there, actually. <laughs> all right. Take it away, Jeff. Tell us all about Quantitech. Okay, thanks a lot. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Rosenberg. I'm the founder and chief science officer of Quantitech. It's a digital chairside solutions company. Um, I knew I wanted to be a dentist in fourth grade. I skipped my last year of high school. I graduated from college early. That's how passionate I was about dentistry, and I'm still that passionate about dentistry. And one of the fascinating things I found, as Brett said, very early on is I saw how oral health affected the whole body. It was fascinating how I could see germs in a mouth and later on see heart disease, diabetes. And I realized that we needed new ways to detect these oral systemic changes. So I started to see the value of oral health in terms of a global market. And in 2004, I took my resources, my energies, and I started Quantitech, which is a digital chairside solutions company. And dentistry is hard. It's hard on the patients. It's hard on the doctors. It's, it's so hard that it creates anxieties for both of them. And our solutions are aimed at reducing those anxieties and increasing the comfort all those things. So now Quantitech, we have seven protected patents. We have strategic alliances throughout the United States, Europe, even Asia. And our goal is to impact those situations with solutions that are done chairside. Now, the oral healthcare market is growing dramatically. And one of the reasons is we now know that germs in the gum line are responsible for diseases that affect the quality and the length of our lives, Alzheimer's, stroke, heart attack, all these diseases happen to be related to germs in the gum line. So Perio Alert is our digital gum line scanner. Perio Alert identifies these pockets of germs in the gum line and it directs a doctor or a dentist as to where they are and what they can do with those one of those germs is a key pathogen, pathogen in Alzheimer's disease, which is, you know, think about it, you work so hard, you get into your golden years, and then all of a sudden you're robbed of that. Well, now we know where those germs are and drugs can be put into that space. Doctors can do it, dentists can do it, creates new revenue streams, but on a bigger scale, it changes oral health and it affects the longevity and the quality of life. We also have chair-side solutions for things like, have you ever had a horrible dental visit where the crown didn't fit, your temporary kept falling out? We've got a solution for that right at the chair. Your child didn't wear their retainer and their teeth got crooked again? We got it. 
five minutes printed out at the chair. We even impact implant dentistry, which is huge with dentists now. We have an ability to create well-fitting natural implant restorations, and it, it reduces the cost both to the patient and the doctor. In our last market that we focused on, which is where we're entering in, is the orthodontic aligner market. Big heavyweights like Invisalign play in this market. And what happens is when you're ready to get your braces off or stop your aligner treatment, you can now have a chair side solution that prints something that will keep your teeth straight and you won't have to keep going through treatment. So we found that we can even print out solutions to headaches, to sleep apnea. All these are done at the chair. They don't have to go through an outsource like a dental lab. The goal of our uh, raise is to really finish these prototypes and begin a scalable subscription and then ultimately finish Perio Alert, which is going to change the way that oral health affects the longevity and quality of our lives. That's it. Awesome. Nice job. Uh, nice job, Dr. Jeff. I'm passionate, man. I love it. I know. I love that. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's probably the most important characteristic for an entrepreneur to have is passion. Uh, and the second most characteristic for an entrepreneur to have is that they're solving a problem worth solving. Um, and it's super clear that your, you know, the, 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 your company is solving a problem worth solving. And I think it's worth noting that it's solving a problem worth solving both for the patient and for the dentist, right? That, um, you know, most dentists in this country are small business people. Um, and a lot of them face a lot of, you know, pressure with regard to reimbursement schedules and the rest of that crap. And so they all want to figure out how to, how to, how, how to make their workflow more efficient, which will drive their business needs as well as make it a better experience for their patients. And as you said, we've all had the experience of having to go into a dentist to have some, you know, mold taken or something. And then we've got to wait for two weeks while it's sent out to a lab to be made. Right. Um, and then we got to make a new appointment and come back and then put in, that's inconvenient for us and it's not an efficient workflow for the dentist. And so the idea of applying 3D printing technologies to be able to produce this stuff on demand chair side, I think is extraordinarily. Uh, uh, and it's an open platform, which is really key because all the other solutions are closed platforms. So you're basically getting a portal to a sale from another company. You don't yeah. own your ability to solve the problem that's right next to you. Right, right. And I, we, there's one question coming in about um, kind of funding status and, um, uh, and whether you're whether you're working on a raise now or where, where does that stand? Yeah, uh, thanks to your program, I've, I've gotten seed capital offers um, and now we're really looking at Series A. Awesome, congrats. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks Dr. Jeff. All right, so um, another major trend or two in the world today. Uh, so first of all, streaming media, obviously, right? That uh, streaming media is huge everywhere from Netflix to, um, to, 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 to Spotify, right? And that's a trend all over the world today. And another kind of global trend is this idea of the decentralization of entrepreneurship and innovation that, you know, the last 30 years or so, the center of entrepreneurship and innovation has been Silicon Valley, uh, but now it's happening all over the world. Um, and one of the side benefits of the fact that it's happening all over the world is that we're able to create innovation that is kind of localized for the, for the regional needs of a population instead of Silicon Valley trying to figure out what, you know, what people in rural India care about. Now people in rural India can do innovation <laughs> that meets their needs, right? And so an example of that is, uh, is Alfred who joins us now. Good evening, Alfred. Evening, Brett. And you are in Kenya, East Africa. Yeah, I'm in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. Nairobi, Kenya. So I asked Alfred yeah. uh, one day we were having a having a meeting, and I asked him what what is what's for dinner tonight, and he said dinner tonight is roast beef and beer. <laughs> and I said that's I said that's that sounds good to me. So yeah. um, so 
so Alfred, we, we accepted Alfred into the into this program because, um, as I said, he's right he's he's right at the intersection of two really salient trends in the world. One is that streaming media is is popular everywhere, and the second is innovation today happening in different pockets around the world makes it easier for innovation to be done in a way that meets the localized needs of a particular community. So, um, Alfred, thanks for joining us, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Brett. Uh, let me shift your focus a bit to Africa and uh, picture yourselves as uh, content creators or content consumers for that matter. Content in this sense would be music, uh, movies, TV shows, documentaries, biographies, podcasts. Uh, the best channels to distribute uh, this media would be through streaming platforms. So at Lumka, we are a general media streaming platform that uh, focuses on African content, but is equally open to global content as well. So Africa for a long time has been underserved in terms of uh, streaming services, uh, with the majority being uh, foreign based with no actual uh, tailor-made solutions for African creators or consumers for that matter. Uh, uh, a majority are subscription based. Uh, you find one that fits your bill, you'd find that uh, the type and nature of content stream that does not probably align with your content. Uh, worst case scenario, you find one that uh, uh, equally fits your bill, but then you cannot directly price your content to your own creators or consumers or viewers for that matter. So at Lumka, we are going to provide a, a subscription uh, 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 free-based platform with no limitation in terms of type and uh, nature of content. We'll equally give uh, content creators the ability to price or uh, put value directly to their own consumers in terms of their own content. Um, uh, what will be our value or uh, differentiating factor from uh, the competition? Uh, our all-in-one uh, uh, platform will be focused on three major features, audio, video, and live stream uh, features that will ensure and guarantee diversity in terms of content, uh, the creators themselves, as well as the consumers for that very content. How does Lumka work? Uh, Lumka offers uh, streaming in two uh in two aspects uh there's free to stream uh, and pay to stream option in which uh pay to stream option we retain 10 percent of all streaming proceeds uh on all pay to stream content and uh the very much uh able team to make all this happen will be i alfred tolbatutieno the co-founder and ceo as well as my very able uh, co-founder beatrice mudoni uh Feel free to reach us out uh, through LinkedIn for more information about our venture and where we are uh, at this particular stage. Thank you. Alfred, that was great. Um, and as you were presenting, I was thinking to myself that I really should, I really should have said you're at the intersection of three trends because the, yeah. the, whole, cre the whole creator economy thing is a big yeah. trend right now too, right? So you're really at the intersection of streaming media, uh, the creator economy, and localized innovation. Yeah. So that's a pretty sweet place yeah. to be. Um, True. So Africa is a very Africa is a very large continent, right? With a whole bunch of countries and a whole bunch of different economies and, 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 and cultures. And so what are your thoughts in terms of how you're going to, how you're going to scale this? Are you going to start with one region and then add regions? How are you going to, how are you thinking about that? Uh, actually, our MVP, we are going to tackle the East African market first, uh, being the hotbed mm -hmm. of everything. Then probably uh, uh, much later, we'll uh, expand to the continent in itself. Then future, we do a global thing altogether. Uh, we, we are yeah. launching our MVP in the next following ca coming days. And then we'll probably follow that up with uh, our mobile app as well. Terrific. And are, are you looking for funding right now, Alfred? Yes, we are actually raising uh, uh, funds. Uh, we are still at a uh, self-sustaining uh, stage, so we are looking for our very first uh, funding investment. Terrific. All right, Alfred, thank you very much. That was great. So another trend um, today is, is, is educational technology, um, edutech. So, you know, online learning has been around, obviously, since the dawn of the Internet age, um, but it, it struggled to catch on for a variety of reasons. And now all of a sudden, 
uh, educational technology is hot. Uh, in the last few months, we've seen IPOs from Coursera and from Udemy and from Duolingo. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, this, this notion of educational technology, which as I said, has been around for 20 years, um, is finally hitting its stride. Um, and so our next presenter, let me find it, find a tool here so I can add him. Our next, <laughs> our next presenter is, uh, is a tool, Jane and a uh, tool you're uh, in, in San Diego today. Is that right? I am. Um, and a tool has, um, you know, he's, you know, you sort of generically in the, in the educational technology space, uh, but in a very specific quarter of that and, uh, and a quarter that, that needs some innovation, um, that, uh, as a tool will tell you more in a second, um, you know, lawyers are required to take a certain number of continuing education credits every, um, every, every few years They're required by bar associations to do that. And as you can imagine, most of the content that's out there that lawyers have to sit through as part of their continuing education stuff is pretty boring, dry content. Um, and a lot of it, you know, was developed by, you know, lawyers a generation ago. And Atul, as a, as a young, young attorney himself, kind of realized that, God, there's a need for some actual content in this field that is engaging and meaningful and relevant to young attorneys practicing today. So uh, Atul, with that introduction, I'll, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Great. Well, thanks, Brett. I really appreciate the introduction, and it's great to be with everyone today. As Brett said, I'm Atul Jain, and I'm the founder of Lawyer Square. As someone who spent nearly a decade in the legal industry, I can tell you firsthand, the business of law is currently booming. It's coming off a year of record profits and soaring growth. And you'd think the legal industry would be sitting pretty. But like many leading companies around the world, law firms are struggling with widening skill gaps within their organizations. And to combat this, they're spending unheard of sums to recruit and retain employees and deal with enormous turnover costs. Research shows that one of the most effective ways to deal with these issues is through investment in employee skill building or upskilling. And we look to build better upskilling within the legal industry. As you might know, upskilling is one of the fastest growing markets worldwide and an area poised for continued growth over the next decade. And as Brett mentioned, we believe there's a unique opportunity within the legal industry because of a built-in upskilling framework. The more than 1.3 million lawyers in the US are required to satisfy millions of hours of continuing legal education credit each year. And this results in almost over a billion dollars a year being spent training US lawyers. We think that provides a significant opportunity to disrupt the market and gain a customer base known for high levels of long-term retention. And that's because simply put, the current model isn't working. We would know. Our team spent over 15 years at some of the world's top law firms. And while we've changed cities and sectors, worked with different clients, one thing has remained the same, our desire for better legal training. And so now we've set out to build it. And we're not alone in our belief. More than 85% of lawyers do not feel their law firms genuinely care about professional development. And that's because the current models become stale with large libraries of lectures that are uninspiring or engaging and fail to build real world skill. In fact, research by Georgetown Law found that in nearly four decades, little has changed in the continuing legal education space. And this is coupled with the fact that millennials now make up the largest generation within the legal community. For a generation keen on advancing their careers and engaging with others, uh, the current model simply won't cut it. And that's where we come in. At Lawyer Square, our mission is to deliver elite legal education to today's modern lawyers. And we're gonna do this by having top lawyers from top learners teach interactive and engaging courses on topics that actually matter. We're gonna build off innovation in the education technology space by having high quality instructors and immersive community discussion groups. For busy lawyers looking to level up in their careers, they'll leave our programs with actionable skills they can use in practice. And we're, hoping, we're also hoping to drive change uh, through our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts by seeking diverse lawyers and amplifying their voices in our platform, as well as partnering with leading organizations in our community. Overall, we think our 
offering will differentiate itself and allow us to become a trusted provider to lawyers, law firms, and in-house legal departments, allowing us to build a budding subscription membership base and grow a lucrative recurring revenue stream. We're really excited about the road ahead, especially at a time where the pandemic has forced law firms to change their approach and put much more investment in technology, innovation, and training. We'd love to talk to you further. We'd invite you to reach out so you can talk so we can talk about how we can both we can build the next generation of legal training and build a better community for today's lawyers. Very nice at all. Yeah, I was um, I was thinking to myself about how when I when I first met Atul when he uh, when he applied to the program, uh, he said he said it's like master master class for lawyers, and I was like, oh, that's perfect. I love that. I love it. I love when there's a nice simple explanation like that because uh, master class is brilliant. I mean, it's really beautifully produced, great stuff, um, and the idea of bringing that to uh, a kind of level of quality content to legal continuing education, I think is, is pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary. So um, we have a question coming in here from uh, uh, Laura, who must be an attorney because uh, she's asking about PLI. First of all, explain to us what PLI is, Atul. Uh, PLI is one of the current course providers. So they've been around, I think, for almost a century. Um, and they're one of the leading providers that have a library of thousands of videos. Um, just reading the question here. I, I mean, I think that the difference in our program is it's, it's supposed to be interactive and modern. Uh, most of the programs out there today are simply lectures that you can view online. And Brett, like you were mentioning, um, there's been some failures in the past with online education. Research shows that historically uh, kind of self-driven online education where the user is the one needing to fulfill the program requirements, um, there's rates as low as 5% um, completion rates. And so our model is more interactive. It's gonna have uh, discussions with instructors. It's also gonna have discussion among participants um, and also have exercises and problem sets where people are building real skills and not just trying to get through a lecture and get their attendance requirements done. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I, I love the diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion angle because, I mean, that's a super important thing today. And, um, you know, it totally makes intuitive sense to me that the legal profession today is a whole lot more, more diverse than it was a generation ago. <laughs> that's so, so I imagine that the content that's out there is, uh, you know, a lot of boring old white men like me. And so, uh, you know, getting some content out there that more, that more, appropriately uh, addresses uh, what young lawyers today care about, I think seems super important. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, there's been some strides in the industry over the, you know, the last five years, but there's a lot of room to grow. And we think there's a lot of great voices to be heard from. And, um, you know, sometimes they're not necessarily amplified or given the platform right. uh, to be visible. So we're hoping right. to do that. Right. And as you've as you've approached, um, you know, like leading partners at, at law firms across the country about, you know, would you like to to prepare a course for us? Have you gotten a good response from them or what's that what's that like for you? Definitely. I think a lot of people are excited. I think they, they realize it's a new model. Um, I think the business of law is, like I said, getting really busy. So there's expectations that younger lawyers can do more and have a better mm -hmm. skill set. And that requires mm -hmm. a new level of training, a, a new approach. So I think folks are excited. I think our diversity and inclusion angle is also um, important to a lot of our instructors. So the response so far has been great. Awesome. Well, congrats on all the success. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the presentation this morning, Atul. Thank you. So um, our last presenter today, uh, and by the way, those first were amazing. Um, and uh, you're going to especially like the last one. So block, blockchain you know, has been one of those kind of buzzword technologies that everybody's like heard of blockchain. Everybody knows that supposedly blockchain represents the future. Um, but, you know, it hasn't really lived up to the hype. It's mostly been associated with cryptocurrency. And um, everybody has told us that there are all kinds of applications, all kinds of use cases for blockchain outside of cryptocurrency. But there have been precious few until now. Um, and when I, when I first met, uh, Asher, he told me about his new, uh, 
startup Tixology. Uh, first of all, just like a tool, uh, Asher totally hooked me with the one-liner, which was his, his one-liner was, we're going to disrupt Ticketmaster. And I was like, oh, you're going to disrupt Ticketmaster? I'm in. Um, and then when he you know, dove a little deeper into that, explained to me about how they were going to use ticketing technology to address the, um, the, sorry, use blockchain technology to address the larger ticketing space, um, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty intrigued. So um, with that introduction, Asher, uh, and you're joining us today from where, by the way? I'm in Toronto today. Toronto. Yes. That's in, That's in Canada, right? That's somewhere. <laughs> yeah, way yeah. up there above you guys. <laughs> All right. So Asher, tell us about Tixology. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brett. Uh, I'm Asher Weiss. I'm the founder, co-founder and CEO of Tixology. Um, I spent the last four years working in the NBA with the Orlando Magic and the Golden State Warriors. And during my time there, I learned a ton about ticketing and a lot of pain points in the industry. So, you know, there's a lot of these major play players in the industry that are too big to change. Um, and they've grown so big that it's impossible to change their entire platform. So they focused a lot on kind of cosmetic changes as opposed to fundamental changes. So the ticket may look different, but at the end of the day, the platform has remained the same. And we feel that the industry needs a fundamental change. So the ticket sale is just one piece of the fan journey, but all the other pieces are fragmented from buying food and beverage to upgrading your seats. And event producers are looking to understand their fans better, get rid of fraudulent tickets and find new revenue sources. So fans are on the other side are looking for a more seamless buying experience. So with this challenge in mind, I brought together a team of technical co-founders to help me tackle this program. Uh, problem. So Jared has years of knowledge building and shipping products. Ross has spent the last eight years working in blockchain and is a very talented developer. Josh spent his last 12 years at Live Nation, uh, also known as Ticketmaster uh, as, a, as of the merger, uh, and Daniel, our talented product designer. And together, uh, we launched Tixology. So Tixology is a blockchain-based ticketing software that puts event producers, venues, and teams in control of their ticketing. So we allow event producers to capture new revenue sources from secondary and collectible sales, understand all their ticket holders, not just their ticket buyers, uh, eliminate fraudulent tickets, and engage their fans on a deeper level. We are a blockchain-based company, but a part of our, our motto is not being complicated. You don't need to be a wizard to use it and take advantage of all the benefits. And we feel like event producers can own the resale market collect new royalties from resale and collectibles and uh, benefit from all the, the benefits of blockchain without the kind of complexities uh, and having to deal with those complexities. And, you know, a little piece here around memorabilia. So there's been a huge growing market for memorabilia in the last few years, as well as the growth of NFTs, which um, are kind of this new way to create digital collectibles is how we're thinking about it. And because our platform is blockchain based, the tickets are NFTs and we see our NFT tickets as the new collectible and a way to drive deeper fan engagement and new revenue sources for event producers. Just a little bit on the market in general, ticketing is a massive market with an untapped secondary market from you know, the event producers and team side and a whole new collectibles market that's still growing and picking up speed. The next few years are going to deliver crazy growth in the ticketing industry, and we want to be a part of that. So we'd love for you to join us on this journey to revolutionize ticketing, and please reach out if you're interested in learning more. Excellent. So all kinds of interesting angles on this. Um, so Asher, you had the experience of working uh, kind of inside the NBA. Um, and so if you were to articulate kind of what you think the problem to be solved is, uh, in terms of, you know, for, for event producers, everyone from sports teams to concert producers, et cetera, what's the, what's the problem to be solved in your mind? Yeah, it, it's interesting, Brett, because we see a lot, a lot of different problems to be solved in the ticketing industry. Um, one um, is kind of this lack of customization and being, you know, allowing event producers and teams and venues to really hone their ticketing, uh, their ticketing software and, and be able to 
cut fully customize what that experience looks and feels like for their end users. Um, another piece is really around lack of control. That's, that's a huge one, right? Like after that initial ticket sale, the ticket goes out into the ecosystem and the venue and team often loses control of that ticket, know who, know who owns it and therefore doesn't benefit from any kind of further transactions that might happen on the ticket. Um, and then a third piece is just in the shift to digital ticketing, um, people are really missing the collectible aspect of the ticket. So we think that that can be a really a big part of our vision as well um, in allowing people to commemorate the events they attend and either, you know, collect, trade uh, or sell those uh, event, you know, NFT ticket stubs after the mm -hmm. event itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, another question comes in, the standard question about fund funding status. What's the funding status right now? Yeah, so we're actually in the process of, of raising an initial round. Um, we're excited to kind of, we're getting close to the end of our product build and uh, we're, we're having uh, initial discussions with some events in kind of um, uh, late winter, early spring. Um, and so we're looking for funding to kind of uh, build out our team a little bit more uh, really hone our product and um, acquire our initial customers. Right, right. So last question for you, Asher, is that, um, so most people are aware that, you know, one of the ways in which Ticketmaster has a stranglehold in the market is they've got exclusive contracts with many uh, teams, event producers, venues, et cetera. So, you know, kind of how do you, how do you see that in terms of, you um, you know, where, where's the available market for you now? Yeah. And then, then how do you get a piece eventually of some of the market that Ticketmaster has contractually tied up right now? Totally. Yeah. So it's, it's twofold. Um, the first side we see that, you know, there are, like you said, there are a lot of big players that um, are working with Ticketmaster and have long-term deals with them. Um, but there's a huge section of the market that, that isn't engaged with Ticketmaster. They can't afford them. They don't want to work with a company that large. Um, we see a big opportunity there. So our initial targets are, um, you know, smaller one-off events, music festivals, conferences, things like that. Uh, we feel like we can get a really good stronghold in that area. Um, and then in terms of some of those bigger customers, um, you know, already having those conversations and there's interest. Um, so there, there's a way there. And then we're also exploring potential integrations with existing ticketing providers to kind of mm -hmm. supercharge the ticket as well um, to, to potentially be able to work with um, some people who are, you know, with, with some of those other bigger players currently. Awesome. Awesome. Well, congrats on all the success so far, Asher. And uh, Thank thanks, you, for, thanks for the terrific presentation this morning. <laughs> okay, so that concludes... Um, the fall 2021 demo day for the fourthly startup accelerator. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. You know, as I said at the at the, at the beginning, um, it's an extraordinary time right now. Uh, the World Economic Forum says that we're now entering the fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution was very much centered around London and was about the steam engine and the cotton gin. The second industrial revolution was centered around this mass production cities like Detroit and Milano, um, and was about electricity and mass production. The third was, was IT, computers, the internet, very much centered in Silicon Valley. And now this fourth industrial revolution that we're now entering, according to the World Economic Forum, is um, kind of the blending of the digital, the cognitive, and the biological, the cognitive being uh, AI and machine learning and all that stuff, right? And there's extraordinary innovation going on all over the world today. And the other thing that is a defining characteristic of the fourth industrial revolution is, as I said, that it's, that it's been decentralized. Um, and that is happening everywhere. And it's, it's, there's been a decoupling of centers of innovation and centers of capital. Um, and so I, 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 I think and I hope these presentations that you've seen from these startups uh, uh, today from all over the world um, have helped to kind of illustrate this fact, the fact that uh, it, it's not just Silicon Valley today. There's extraordinary um, stuff being done by entrepreneurs and innovators all over the world uh, in really kind of meaningful ways to change uh, to change the status quo and to solve problems that are worth solving. So um, thank you very much for joining. Um, as I said, I've, I'm in Lisbon, Portugal this week. I'm usually a Silicon Valley guy, um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to tune in. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm.